So this is a series of videos concerning PLCs and the relationship with their share price and market capitalization. Now within this particular video, I'm going to be focusing on what an IPO is and the reasons why a firm would launch an IPO and, and become that PLC. Saying goes, ideas are a dime a dozen. Acting on an idea though can make all the difference. Say you turn your vision into a startup. It starts small, then it gets even bigger. Then it gets even bigger. Until one day you may get to decide it's time for your company to go public. IPO stands for Initial Public Offering. It's the very first sale of a stock issued by a company on the public market, which essentially means you're turning your private company into a public one. So when it's private, a company is normally owned by a small number of investors. That usually consists of people like you, your friends, or parents, plus professional investors like a venture capital firm. Once the company goes public, you're opening up that business to be owned by a large number of people. In effect, the firm goes from being owned by just a few people to potentially tens of thousands of shareholders. To commemorate the event, most stock exchanges hold a ceremony of sorts. At the New York and London stock exchanges, you'll ring the bell. At the Hong Kong stock exchange, you'll strike the bell. So why go public? Well, going public raises a lot of cash for a company. With that money, it becomes easier to scale and grow, invest in infrastructure, and attract top candidates. Plus, there's the bragging rights you get from being listed on a stock exchange. It's important to note that large companies can also stay private, too. IKEA, Mars, Aldi, and State Farm are just some examples of massive companies that are private. After all, going public isn't a simple process, normally taking about four months to complete. The company will start with finding what's known as an underwriting firm, typically an investment bank or several. If and when the firm takes on the job, they put up the money to fund the IPO, essentially buying the shares before they're actually listed anywhere. The firm works with the company to determine what type of security to issue, an offering price, the number of shares, and the optimum time to bring a company to the public market. In the U.S., they also handle registering with the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission, which makes sure all of the financial information has been disclosed and is accurate. Then, you're finally good to go. The underwriter's goal is to sell shares to the public for more than it paid the company. After all, that's how they make their money. But going public can also mean a nice payday for the business's founders and early investors. You often hear about people becoming millionaires or even billionaires after their company goes public. Here's why. If you've worked at a private company that's intending to go public one day, sometimes part of your compensation is given through equity, part ownership of the firm. It's a way to hire talented people without a lot of cash up front. And if the company does go public, you get a piece of it at its new valuation. Here's an example. When Snapchat went public in 2017, its founder, Evan Spiegel, scored big. Spiegel got a stock grant of $636 million when the company went public. The following year, he sold more than 2.6 million shares. The sale of his stock was equivalent to $50 million. The number of companies going public is constantly fluctuating. Globally, 1,764 companies floated in 2017, a nearly 50% increase since 2016, and the most IPOs since 2007. 189 of 2017's IPOs were in the US, a 70% increase from the year before. A few of the biggest IPOs in history include Facebook, Visa, and General Motors. And in 2014, Alibaba smashed the record with its debut on the New York Stock Exchange, bringing in $25 billion. All that said, going public has its drawbacks. Publicly traded companies are subject to oversight by regulators like the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. And once you list your company on an exchange, you're not just reporting to yourself anymore, you answer to all your shareholders. If you don't make them happy, you can be sidelined or even fired from the company you founded. You know, a company is considered to be a private, and as a private company, the firm will have grown with a relatively small number of shareholders, including early investors like the founders, venture capitalists, or business angels. So when a company reaches a stage in its growth process where it believes itself to be mature enough for the, the rigours of the required regulations, along with the benefits and the responsibilities to public shareholders, it will begin to advertise its interests in going public. Now, IPO shares of a company are priced through underwriting due diligence, which assesses the market maturity of the IPO candidate. So it focuses on uh, the market and the competitive analysis, as well as assessing potential risk and opportunities uh, and risks in the commercial and legal environment of that company. 
So the IPO team working on this will be formed of underwriters, uh, lawyers, CPAs, which are certified public accountants, and SECs, which are securities and exchange commissions. So the previously owned private share ownership converts to public ownership, and the existing private shareholders, uh, their shares become worth the public trading price. So sometimes these shares are cashed in to earn return, or they're kept hold of. Now, an IPO consists of two parts. So the first is the pre-marketing phase of the offering, whilst the second is the IPO itself. Now, information regarding the company is compiled, including the forming of a board of directors, and the company will issue its shares on an IPO date. And this will be issued in the primary market, whereas the firm will acquire share capital as equity to finance the firm's growth. Now, when these shares are then traded, they're traded in the secondary market. And this is where we can see a change in market capitalization. So here's a couple of summary points. So to begin with, it's the process of offering shares of a private corporation to the public in new stock issuance. It's a, the public share issuance allows a company to raise capital from public investors. And that is known as share capital. The increased transparency and share listing credibility can also be a factor in helping it obtain better credit terms when seeking borrowed funds as well. Uh, the fact that, for example, banks, if they if they want to increase their gearing and their gearing is it, it grow by a debt, uh, they'll probably have a better chance of doing so because of the transparency of being um, a public limited company and the bank being able to access a lot of information regarding the company. But also it brings about a lot of media attention and the company is much more well known which can also help with its uh, potential growth. Uh, the public market contribute capital to a company's shareholder equity. So again, that, sh that share capital that they receive um, is known as shareholder equity, which goes into the firm to fund its growth. And it increases the company's exposure, its prestige and public image, which can help the company's sales and profits. Um, as you'll see within this video, when a company does... Um, I suppose, create interest in, in carrying out an IPO. The media are interested in that information and they will often um, cover it. And then when the IPO actually takes place and they issue that initial public offering, then usually it's the big news of that day. What do you want to get into the nitty-gritty of when that public information does come on Snap? Well, obviously the revenue. I mean, that's eMarketer forecasts that Snapchat's going to have $935 million in revenue this year. Uh, we want to know if that's true, first of all. But second of all, you know, this is a company that's growing so substantially. Uh, it's becoming a part of the lexicon, just like Facebook was a few years ago. And it's exciting to watch just how much they've changed the way that young people communicate. What, in terms of the question marks, are still left for you? Because they're trying, as you say, they're going out trying to woo in the future of Snap. They're yeah. trying to make sure that it looks like there's options in terms of marketing, in terms of perhaps not just millennials. What are you left with concerns about, perhaps? Well, certainly the advertisers are still wondering just how effective Snapchat is. They've done a lot to make... Uh, the advertising more effective, but still very experimental for advertisers. Uh, I think uh, usage, I mean, obviously we see a lot of teens and young adults using Snapchat, but are the moms, are the grandmas going to use Snapchat? You know, maybe not. Does that matter? Those are some questions that I have. Airbnb investor who believes the next wave of consumer IPOs will reflect an innovation revolution. Venture capitalist Rick Heitzman is CEO of First Mark Horizon Acquisition. Rick, great to see you. Welcome back to the show. Thank you. Thank you. You know, Deidre had mentioned, uh, you know, the bad taste maybe left in some investors' mouths who invested in Lyft and in, in Uber. But on the other side of it, we see a reach for, for high growth companies. What do you think will prevail in this sort of pandemic trading environment? I think you've seen uh, a lot of companies go public and perform very well if you look at Snowflake on the enterprise side. But I think the problems that Uber and Lyft have faced are, are dealing specifically to that transportation sector, specifically related to, I mean, I don't, I don't know what your personal habits are, but the amount of people taking Uber and Lyft have dramatically decreased since the pandemic. If you look at other names that are focused on the consumer, DraftKings has, has performed excellently since its public debut earlier this year via SPAC listing. And also, you've seen Pinterest double in price. You've seen Snapchat and Twitter increase in price over time. And I think it's, it's probably less specific 
to the growth that you were seeing in, in that sector, and more specific to folks chasing growth, chasing a high return on investment, and, and some of these consumer names. For an Airbnb, you know, during the pandemic, I didn't think that anybody would want to go to an Airbnb in that sort of environment. And yet here we are. Business, as Deidre had mentioned, is, is in fact booming. Is there a rush, in your view, to get that out the door now that things are hot? And what happens when things go back to normal and people actually start flying and, and staying at hotels again? I, I think that people, we were already seeing before the pandemic, tremendous uptake from Airbnb. And they were t both taking shares from traditional hotels as well as vacation homes. And then in the pandemic, they've done a great job on a couple of different things. We've seen more folks go and do kind of work from home somewhere else. So if you're living in a place like New York, living in a place like San Francisco, you know, do you really want to work out of a small apartment or would you rather go to Lake Tahoe or the Catskills? We've also seen the desire to go to another place and, and whether it be, you know, a driving vacation. The Airbnb kind of pivoted from what was historically called the top three, top five cities, the Londons, the Parises, and New Yorks, to doing more of, hey, here's a two-hour driving vacation, which you might do as a different alternative this summer or fall, and experiences. So I think that they've pivoted in response to COVID. I think if travel were to come back and hospitality were to rebound, they'd also have be able to take advantage of that trend. So clearly the timing of an IPO is also important. Uh, with Airbnb capitalising on this recent pandemic of travel restrictions abroad and reduced desire for hotel stays due to social distancing, they're believing this is a key time. Uh, but also they've got plans for the future uh, and they believe that even when the economy returns back to normal, they'll be in a very good position and, and hence why they believe this is the right time to, co to carry out that IPO. Uh, however, again, uh, when considering um, a previous video of Snapchat, uh, they went public and there was curiosity as to whether the firm um, would do well as a PLC and whether it will generate the interest. Clearly it did, as Snapchat sold 200 million shares priced at $17 and they generated $3.4 billion. Now, they didn't keep the whole $3.4 billion, uh, of which $2.5 billion uh, would go to the company's share capital and the remaining $900 million uh, went to early investors and executives. However, at this time, Snapchat were actually making a net loss. But yet investors were still attracted enough to buy shares due to its potential and its long-term growth potential. So even if their, div their dividends would have been limited in the short term, the, because they're not making a profit, um, clearly investors were not worried about that and they were just thinking about the future. So that, again, it, it depends on um, shareholder objectives as well. And another example of this uh, is Twitter. This morning, this area was completely packed. Lots of people here excited about today's IPO of Twitter. And the fact that there were so many people on the floor of the stock exchange was sort of an indication of how much anticipation there was for when Twitter became a publicly traded stock. And, you know, it it's initially had priced itself at $26, but at the open, it raised, it went up to $45.10. And at one point today, it even hit hit just over the $50 mark. So a lot of excitement about Twitter and a lot of investor interest. Those of us with a long, long memory will go back to 99 and 2000 and the first dot-com bubble when some shares were being sold for hugely inflated prices, regardless of the fact of whether a site was making any money or not. Why is Twitter able to convince, convince investors this is a price worth paying? You know, and that's a really good question, and lots of people have been asking that, because Twitter, in the seven years it's been in existence, has yet to turn a profit. And what money investors are banking on is its potential to make money. Now, unlike Facebook, Twitter is very well poised in the mobile department, and, and it's with mobiles that you're seeing a lot of the growth potential, and it's mobile advertising specifically. So you have 75% of Twitter users that are accessing it on their mobile devices. And so the fact that they already have such a strong footing in that department, you know, investors are banking on that they have the potential to make a lot of money off of that mobile advertising. In fact, one company has suggested that they could increase their revenues by 100% in the mobile department. There's always a risk when you're purchasing shares at an IPO for a firm that's making a loss. And just betting on potential um, 
it can obviously bring about, bring about problems. So when we consider the dot-com bubble in the late 1990s and the value of equity uh, markets, which grew exponentially with the technology-dominated NASDAQ index rising from under 1,000 to more than 5,000 between the years of 95 and 2000, it, it, it can obviously bring back these memories. So many investors wanted to get in on the tech revolution, believing that big tech stock was the future and speculatively uh, bought. However, unfortunately, many tech firms issued shares overpriced and around on March the 13th, uh, the year 2000, news that Japan had entered a recession triggered, uh, triggered a global sell-off that disproportionately affected tech stock. A couple of days later, Yahoo and eBay ended merger talks, which again hit the markets. And then a week later, news was coming out that internet companies were running out of cash fast, predicting many bankruptcies. Investor confidence was further eroded by several accounting scandals and the resulting bankruptcies include the Enron scandal in October 2001 and the Worldcom scandal in June 2002. And by the end of the stock market downturn of 2002, stock had lost $5 trillion worth in market cap since the peak. So therefore, there are always concerns when an industry suddenly starts to see a lot of movement in IPOs and as to whether they've learnt the lesson of the dot-com bubble. So there, there are issues which arise from an IPO, and this is for the firm itself rather than the investor. And that's the significant legal accounting and marketing costs which arise, many of which are actually ongoing. It also requires uh, an increase in time, effort and attention by the management for reporting. And other issues can be the fluctuations of the company's share price, can be distraction from management. And it can be compensated and evaluated based on stock performance rather than the real financial results, even if they do have links. So the summary points for the issues of a firm carrying out an IPO are Number one, an IPO is expensive and the costs of maintaining a public company are ongoing and usually unrelated to the actual cost of production for the business. Um, the company becomes required to disclose financial accounting tax uh, and other business information. Uh, during these uh, disclosures, it may have, uh, I suppose, publicly revealed secrets and business methods that could help competitors. There's a loss of control and stronger agency problems due to new shareholders who obtain voting rights. And this can effectively control company decisions by the board of directors. And the risk that required funding will not be raised if the market does not accept the IPO price. So in other words, if the, the market believes that the IPO is, over, is, is overpriced.